Hey everyone, it's Simi Shaw, and welcome to Trailblazers. On this podcast, I dive deep into the journeys of trailblazing South Asians, sharing the stories of the leaders and dreamers lighting the way across the South Asian diaspora. Welcome back, Trailblazers. Before I get to today's episode, Here's a quick message from our partner this season, McKinsey & Company. Find out about the biggest ideas in business on McKinsey's Insights app, where you can listen to podcasts like our flagship show, The McKinsey Podcast. We're so not tuned in to the dynamic going on for the current employees, what matters to them most. Or watch our author talk series featuring law professor Dorothy A. Brown. 60% of Black college students don't graduate. And when I came across that statistic... I got so depressed. And read lots of articles within our many newsletters like Mind the Gap, which offers insight about Gen Z. To hear, see, and read more, download McKinsey's Insights app now. Today, I am so thrilled to introduce you all to someone who immediately inspired me the first time I met him, Ziad Ahmed. At 23 years old, Ziad is our youngest trailblazer to date. He is the CEO and co-founder of Juve Consulting, a purpose-driven Generation Z consultancy that works with clients to help them reach young people. To date, the company has worked with over 20 Fortune 500 companies, has been profiled by the New York Times, and has established full-time offices around the United States. A recent graduate of Yale University, Ziad actually started this company in 2016 while he was in high school and has kept it growing since. Earlier on in his life, he also founded a nonprofit called Redefy, which was committed to furthering equality. Ziad has also done significant work in progressive politics, having worked for the U.S. Department of State, Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, and Martin O'Malley's 2016 campaign. He's also an active speaker, as well as leader and advisor for the Women's March Youth in Power, Yara Shahidi's organization, and various other campaigns and movements focused on igniting young people to become more civically engaged. Ziad's commitment to purpose-driven entrepreneurship is so infectious, so energizing, that I absolutely can't wait to share his story with you today. Thank you for joining me today, Ziad. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. And yeah, excited to dive in. Absolutely. So I actually want to start at the beginning of the Juve story. You started the company in 2016 while you were still in high school. I did. Can you tell me the Genesis story? Yeah, I'm happy to. I guess it's worth noting at the get that I don't know that I recommend anyone following in my footsteps (laughs) or that I would do it again. But I did it for better and for worse and certainly made a ton of mistakes as I went along. But Long story short, I am from Princeton, New Jersey, and grew up in a really privileged environment where I was really lucky to have a lot of access to people and education and opportunity, but simultaneously also saw how in my school environment and how around me, kids were being otherized because of the color of their skin or how they prayed or whatever it might be, and saw how oftentimes it wasn't happening out of Malice would maybe ignorance, people not knowing how to talk to people that were different than them. And again, this was within the confines of a relatively privileged space, right? Yeah. And where I felt like we could do better. The hope being that we had the resources maybe to do better. Anyways, I switched school in seventh grade that I really became aware of gender norms because I went from an all boys school to a co ed secular school and just started to see how the way that my school was operating, my hallways looked, didn't feel right to me. Okay. And so started a nonprofit, actually. It wasn't a nonprofit at the time. It was a, an organization that eventually became a nonprofit, but built around this idea that perhaps we could tell our stories to each other and humanize our perception of the other and build a more inclusive community. And it ended up taking off in ways that I could never have imagined because these things impact young people, current events, stereotypes, right, identity. And our schools don't often, especially 10 years ago, did not do a great job of tackling these things. And so we created space to talk about them in a time when before the infographic era of social media, people really weren't necessarily, at least in my context, using social media, creating space at school to talk about these issues and things. Sure. And so it's really started to gain traction. And so through that, I found myself in rooms that I didn't know existed, right? With politicians, with industry leaders, with decision makers at 15, 16 years old, where oftentimes I was the youngest person in the room by two decades. And I would enter these rooms and I feel really lucky and privileged to be there, but also really angry. Like, why am I the only one? 
And I would look around and be like, we need so many more diverse young voices in these rooms and people that are far smarter and have overcome a lot more barriers and obstacles than I have in these rooms alongside us because this isn't going to do it, sure. right? Especially because there's so many conversations happening about young people where no diverse young people are invited into those conversations. And so I became really frustrated with that paradigm. And so my junior year of high school, I got together and met some friends and I said, I think we have to do something about this. I think the world looks better when diverse young people have a seat at the table. And I think that Absolutely. the status quo is not it, is not working. And so got started then again, had no idea what the hell I was doing, was not qualified <laughs> at all to get started and, and never expected to be doing it full time seven years later now. I mean, almost seven years later now, but what a roller coaster it has been. Wow. So I'm curious, how did you actually get this business off the ground? I mean, did you fundraise? How did you recruit these no, friends? What were those initial no, steps you took? Definitely did not fundraise. I still have not fundraised. So like I said, I started this nonprofit, Redefy, when I was sort of at the end of eighth grade, launched, launched formally at the beginning of ninth grade. And through that journey, and again, it wasn't a formal nonprofit when we started. It was really a social media page. It was, I troubleshot in WordPress for weeks to make a WordPress <laughs> website, right? It was Instagram. It was, you know, Been Facebook. Been there, done that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very bare bones. And through that journey, I ended up meeting a lot of people, okay. whether that was journalists or nonprofit founders or whatever it might be. Where, again, I realized sort of this paradigm that people needed to talk to young people but didn't really have a good place to do that, to build with us. The summer after my sophomore year of high school, I did a summer program where I studied business at a college. And I met some friends there, one of whom told me that she was doing some consulting for small businesses in her town around social media. And we got together and I was like, wait, I have an idea. I think we can make this bigger. And the first steps were like registering a business and basic things like that, which aren't necessarily that expensive. And so that's just like pulling together birthday money or whatever it might be to do that. I don't remember exactly how maybe that initial sure. few hundred dollars probably came together. But then from day one, we were essentially profitable in the sense that us as co-founders were in a really privileged position where we didn't pay ourselves for years. We paid all the students and contractors who worked for us, but we didn't have any overhead, no offices, nothing. We started charging clients and that was small nonprofits and small publications and people that we'd met and you know, reached out to the network and community that we've already built through our various journeys and, and then using social media and our young friends talking about on social media yeah. with their communities and things like that. And it just started to really grow organically from there and were profitable very quickly as there wasn't a lot of cost and there was a lot of demand. And then we've just really grown from there and invested our money back into the business and trying to run a really responsible, purpose-driven, community-oriented business. And easier said than done, but we're trying our best. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I'm curious, today you guys offer a very wide range of services from helping people amp up their social media to target Gen Z to creating marketing campaigns from scratch. When you first started, what was your pitch when you're going out to these businesses and nonprofits? Yeah. So when we started then, when I was a junior in high school, I was not the original CEO of the company. I was too busy with my nonprofit and model UN and student government. And, and being a high schooler. <laughs> yeah, and being a high schooler and just trying to live a life. My co-founder, Melinda, she was the original CEO. And then when she went to college, she ended up falling in love with other interests, as people do. And then I became CEO. And But... I never, in my wildest dreams, expected to be doing this full time. I didn't know what a holding company was. I didn't know what a CMO was. I never aspired to be in marketing or business. I never really even aspired to be an entrepreneur. I had this idea of something that I thought should exist in the world. I got to go to some friends and I thought this would be a small side project. Our original pitch was just that basic truth of my story having been in high level rooms with decision makers, with politicians, with companies and realizing that the questions they were asking about Gen Z were just like, so wild and so out of touch with reality and the way that we are communicating with each other, the way that we are thinking about the world. And I use we in a really broad sense. Obviously, Gen Z is not a monolith and it's a myriad of ways that people live and think and exist. But any of those myriad of ways were not being acknowledged or represented in these rooms. And the pitch was, right now, you're talking about young people, but not talking to us. Let's fix that. And... Mm. We have an amazing network and I have built a really a wonderful community of Riverside people through my nonprofit journey and through just being like maybe a social person. I don't know. <laughs> and got to know a lot of really dynamic, wonderful humans. And so brought them together through this community at Juve and then said to our clients, learn from these folks, right? Earnestly yeah. listen. And in the beginning, it was a lot more research and strategy. Let us teach you. 
oh, you've never heard what a Finsta is? Let's explain to you what a Finsta is and why that's relevant. And a lot of the pitch was just like showcasing things like a Finsta, talking about the things that matter to us and then being like, I'd never heard of that. And us being like, that's wild, right? Because this is all we're talking about, even to this day. And obviously Finstas are not huge now, but there's a million examples of whatever the Finsta is of the moment of things that we still bring up every single day. And I was in a meeting with a big company the other day and we referenced Venmo and Cash App and they were like, what are those? Oh, wow. Those aren't things that I put in there to be like, oh, like, gotcha, you don't know this. (laughs) There's just a lot of things that you take for granted, right? And that's really why I started the company. I took for granted that I assumed the people in power, I assumed the people who were decision makers knew a little bit about us. And then I realized, (laughs) no, maybe not, right? And that was the pitch. It was showcasing them how much they didn't know and then them trusting us as an authority to help through not my voice, but the voices of many young people, educating them on the myriad of lived experiences in our generation such that they could meaningfully empower us forward. Because it's really hard to come up with an idea that empowers young people if you have no idea where we're lacking agency or lacking community right now. Absolutely. Today, you've worked with the likes of Unilever, VF, and a dozen other Fortune 500 companies. And your youth, as you've noted, was your biggest selling point. But I imagine you did face some pushback or at least skepticism at the outset. What was that like? I still do every day. But of course, less so than I did. I think there is sometimes a presumption that entrepreneurship is risky. For me, that wasn't the case. I'm a really risk-averse person. The stakes weren't that high. I was a student until a year and a half ago. I didn't have real overhead until two, three years ago. And so a lot of this business was us just like really dreaming up what is the company we want to run? What do we want to do in doing those things? And so, yeah, we faced a lot of skepticism, but okay, and why? Because of our age and because of our privilege and because of the unique circumstances around our company, the fact that we didn't raise and all of these things, we had a lot of latitude and still have a lot of latitude in a lot of ways to be like, okay, like you're going to undermine our value, then you're not for us. Mm. And I feel less empowered sometimes to make those choices now because now I have overhead and I have employees with kids and I care right, deeply about my community, about the responsibility that I have to my team, to my clients in a way that before I didn't have really retainer clients and employees with kids, I didn't have offices. But there have been many, 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 many moments where, and even now, people have made me feel unwelcome or people have made us feel undermined or used or exploited even, for sure. But for me, that motivates us further in the sense that it showcases that the need for what we do is that much greater to showcase that maybe there's a different model of business that can work, that there needs to be more of us in places of power because the current people that are often in power are not often leading with enough heart or compassion or curiosity, right? And we're trying to disrupt those paradigms. But That isn't to say there haven't been a million hard nights of wondering, like, is this worth it? Is anyone listening? Of course, there's been countless nights of that. But when I look at my experience in some, I I don't necessarily remember all the naysayers. I remember all the people who have been so inexplicably kind and so many people taking a chance on us and saw themselves in us and chosen to uplift us and chosen to empower us and offer us time and energy and wisdom and community and... I'm just really grateful. I think that for so many reasons, Juve and the work that we do violates a lot of business norms in terms of how we operate, in terms of what we do. Like what? Like typically when you run a marketing organization, the pitch is you pay me $1, I make you $2. That's not our pitch. It's never been our pitch. Typically, all holding companies or marketing agencies are started by people who used to work at a holding company that spin off. Right. And have a lot of the acumen, the knowledge, the know how, the fact that a bunch of diverse young people from so many different lived experiences, (laughs) many of whom have never thought about business, marketing, advertising at all, could come together and meaningfully orient ourselves around purpose driven goals, community, not sell this pitch of you pay me one, I make you two and sell you on what you don't know and empowering young, diverse voices. Mm and run a profitable business and scale it to having offices in New York and LA and employees with kids and have people now who used to work at these big agencies who are coming to work for kids was beyond, it is beyond my wildest imagination, right? And a lot of basic things that we've done violate a lot of business norms. There's a lot of decisions that I make where we are actively choosing not to make more money. We are actively choosing to do what feels right or what feels good, even at the expense of bottom line and 
the basic business principles would tell us that the odds are really against us, right? We have no yeah. business acumen. We have no business being in the rooms that we're in. I'm often at conferences and the youngest person by two, three, four decades. How did it happen? I've been really lucky. I've been really privileged. But <laughs> my point is, like, I feel like in so many ways, lucky, first and foremost, in that the fact that we can violate all these business norms and exist, I'm just like, thanks be to God. Alhamdulillah. And thanks, yeah. to everybody who, and thanks be to anybody who's ever believed in me, because without them, I wouldn't believe in me. There are so many moments where I don't, where I question and I pinch myself. And so for every person who has instilled in me a confidence that what we're doing works, matters, is important, I'm really grateful. To that end, did you have a moment when you were building Juve where you were like, this is it. We are on the map. Yeah, I would say there have been a number of moments like that. What was the initial one? So when we first started, I think, again, a lot of people associate entrepreneurship with a desire to amass wealth. I had no idea there was money in it. <laughs> Our first contracts we ever priced were like $250. Like, I'm not kidding. Wow. I had no idea that there was money in marketing. And you know this, like coming from a South Asian background, these yes. are not fields that we are taught have money in them. These are not fields that we are taught have any security or stability or stature. And I certainly did not grow up believing that there was billion dollar holding company. I, I had no concept. I had never heard of a holding company. I had never heard of this whole ecosystem when media planning and buying it. Like, what the heck? But point is, we started really small, working with nonprofits, working with local businesses. And that's really what I envisioned this company was. It was working with local businesses and nonprofits. And what happened was one of our first few clients was like a small Gen Z facing publication. And our first worker of social media went to church with somebody, etc. And small, small, small contract. But he used to be a former journalist, the guy who started the publication. Okay. And I'll give him a shout out. I love him. David Yee, very good light. They also now are a beauty brand. But David talked about us to some of his friends. And one of them ended up reaching out and ended up writing a piece about us that got placed in Bloomberg Business Week in print six months after launching. Wow. And that was, I think, a huge moment for us. We were yeah. working with great, amazing, exciting folks like David Yee and Very Good Light and, you know, different nonprofits and small businesses. But... Suddenly, after this article was written, big companies were reaching out to us. Also keep in mind, we launched 2016. People still thought of us as millennials. Now Gen Z is in every headline. But like you'll remember, yep. when we were in high school, most of us still thought of us ourselves as millennials, right? Absolutely, yeah. The vernacular around Gen Z was pretty new in 2016. And so like, the headline was the Gen Z consultants. And <laughs> it was this big moment of people being like, what's Gen Z? You can consult on this, right? And like you can read in the article, it says how much we price each contract. And it's like $1,000. <laughs> At the time, that's how much we charge. <laughs> Even that, the fact that we could get to four figures was incomprehensible to us. The first time we ever signed a four-figure contract, which like today's pretty business standard dollars. Pretty standard practice. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were like... <laughs> I can't even believe this is possible. I can't even believe yeah. that this is truly like when we were in Bloomberg Business Week and the people started to reach out and the people started to offer us real money, mind boggled. And I think it was then that we realized, oh, wow, there's a there there. There's a here here, right? And yeah. I think for all of us, it was a question of to what extent do we want there to be a there there? Do we want there to be a here here? We are a company and I am a person that has a lot of critique of business, has a lot of critique of marketing, did not aspire for this for myself. I love what I do in so far as I love puns and I love storytelling and I love community building, but like, I don't love running a business. I've had to learn to become good at parts of it, but I don't know that any of us wanted that, wanted yeah. for this to be a business business. But here we are and I'm challenged yeah. by it every day. I want to spend a second on that because I find it super interesting given we live in such a time where entrepreneurship and being a founder is very glorified. Everyone's like, oh, I want to go start a VC-backed business tomorrow. It's going to become a unicorn in five years. What's your take on that environment today? And what advice do you I have, have so for others? Sharing? <laughs> Look, I am in no place to give anyone advice. And I will never give anyone advice in the perspective that I will say on a platform like a podcast and so far as I think to give good advice requires a really large amount of context, right? Sure. And everybody is faced with a unique set of obstacles, a unique set of opportunities. And so I would never want to give blanket advice. Give us your takeaways then. I can give you my take. I can give you my take. Okay. So my take is, for me personally, the way that I think of entrepreneurship or the way that I encourage maybe the kids that I hope to one day have think about entrepreneurship is I believe that it should stem from a place of 
you see a problem in the world and you want to fix it. A real pain point that you or somebody that you know is experiencing that you have come up with a novel solution to address and that you should be fueled by the alleviation of that problem, which actually would mean that success would be the company no longer existing. Because you've solved the problem. You've solved the problem. Yes. I have done my job if 25-year-olds are now getting hired as vice presidents of marketing. I have done my job if thousands, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of diverse young people are meaningfully empowered by the work that we've done. We have, in part, solved the problem that we set out to address, which is that diverse young voices did not have enough say or sway in the rooms that are about us or pertain to us. One of my gripes with, I think, the way that I think things are trending, to your point, is because of venture capital and because of the ecosystem, there's a lot of perverse and false incentive structures, where even a lot of really interesting novel ideation was inflated by venture such that the actual cost of supplying that thing and what people are willing to pay for it is not ever going to intersect, right? Yeah. Because it was only ever at an affordable cost to the consumer at where the consumer actually demanded it because of venture. And then we also see a lot of people who are like, oh, I want to be a founder. It's like, for what? It's like, oh, we're going to go find a problem to solve, right? Yeah. And then you get a lot of really contrived products and a lot of really contrived organizations where they are not culturally bound by mission because the founding team wasn't convened around a problem to solve and was passionate about the problem. It was convened around strategic skill sets that could solve maybe any problem, which I think culturally and transformationally leads to the later problems. And so I think in general, the ecosystem today has a lot of holes in it insofar as I think creating structures where you're incentivized to grow as quickly as you can, irrespective of market product fit, irrespective of purpose or mission driven on ethos and impact, and impact yeah. right? And irrespective of if there will ever be a supply and demand curve that me, right? Like that's just <laughs> the basic fundamental of business. Is there demand for us? And can you supply it? And why are you the right person to supply it? Yeah. That's like the basic question that we ought to be asking, I think. And I think that that question is sometimes obscured because it's like, oh, like there's so much money to be made. But the reality is 90% of startups fail. The reality is entrepreneurship is mostly late nights and pulling your hair out and constantly questioning if you're good enough and trying to be the best boss that you can be. But it's really hard to be a good boss trying to be the best like service provider that you can be. But it's really hard to be a good service provider and like trying to be all of these things at once and holding that intention. And it's not that I'm not so privileged. I am. And I sit in an incredibly privileged and lucky spot, but it's not something that I would do again. Right? <laughs> like, and I run a very different business. I don't run venture back one, et cetera. But point being, I think there is a lot of glorification of being a founder of entrepreneurship, and I think a lot of that has been inspired by this overinflation of a VC bubble that we are seeing being yep. burst right now. And, and I think by a lot of stories of people that we are now seeing maybe ran a lot of really not structurally sound and not culturally strong organizations where ultimately the supply and demand curve did not meet. Yeah. I hope as we unravel these stories and take our takeaways, I hope that we become less fixated with a shiny number, right, or Silicon Valley and become more fixated with real problems that need to be solved and real solutions that we can uniquely offer that hopefully empower the many, not the few. Absolutely. I love that. And I agree with a lot of the takes. Now, I want to double back on your journey as a founder to that end, because you keep saying that you wouldn't necessarily do this again if you went back. After you graduated from high school, you went to college, you're a full-time student and a full-time founder. I mean, can you speak a little bit about what it was like to balance that? Yeah, I don't really know what to say because sometimes I think to myself now, when I'm a year, I graduated in, in May 2021. I literally don't know how I did it. When I was in college and working and going from class to a speech, back to class in the same day or to a meeting, I look back and I'm like, no, really, how did I? How did I do both at the same time? Yeah. If I have to do one marginally additional thing, my body cannot. And I'm getting old and I can't do what I used to do. I'm 23 and I don't have the same stamina I used to have. But how did I do it? And part of that is true. Like, I really don't know. But how did I do it? One, I think I had momentum in my favor. Right? I'd been running at this sort of pace since I was like 13, 14. So it's all I knew, right, was to juggle. Right? And I think in high school, we all, so like not all, but many of us feel... You're doing sports and you're doing school and you're yep. doing extracurriculars, you're doing college applications. And so there's that, already that muscle of it's all just work and you're just juggling and cycling through it, right? 
And in some ways, like I kind of miss school now because work was a break from school and school was a break from work. Right. Yeah. And so you got to toggle back and forth in ways that like intellectually got to it's exercise good for you. different muscles. And yeah. what I sort of miss about school. We were in school and it's kind of crazy to think about what we did in high school, right? You were at school from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And you sports from 3 to 5 and you go home and you eat dinner and then you work until 11 and then you do it all again the next day and on the weekends. You do your SAT prep, like you do your hanging out with friends, like you're never off. And you have sports games and all the things. And I think it's, we were able to do it, one, because we're young and two, because it's different muscles. If you do the same thing all day, every day is what I think really drains you. But I think when you're like switching between the things that's more fulfilling, I think, is my thesis. I think that was true for me. But then moreover, I was able to do it because I had the best freaking team in the world. I had the best freaking support system in the world. Every win, every success is my mother's, right? It is my sister's, it is my friends, it is my co-founders, it is my teams, it is my roommates and suite mates. So many people had, to, my mentors and advisors and clients, like so many people, like I was saying, had to believe in me, had to support me for any of this to be possible. And not to say that like I've done something extraordinary, like I don't know that I have, but to say that like any win, however big or small or insignificant or significant, I share with so many others. And so I think that was a big part of it. I think also was, I made college easy for me. Like I studied political science or something I was really interested in, right? I already knew a bit about and took classes that played to my strengths. And it was a lot of strategic planning and making it work scheduling wise. And it's possible, right? And I was lucky to go to a school where it was possible and that was not too far from New York and where I could, you know, there was a lot of once a week classes that I could take. And so it was a lot of strategy and organizational planning to make it happen and playing to my strengths, leaning on community, not being afraid to ask for help. And yeah, also maybe burning the candle at all ends of the stick and um, (laughs) playing with fire a little bit. Yeah, I love that. I want to spend some time talking about Juve itself and the work that you've done there. Being almost now six, seven years into building this business, what are some of the more robust trends you've seen with regard to what companies miss about marketing to this generation? Can you speak to any specific projects? Yeah. I think the number one thing that I say companies miss or that I'm trying to solve for that problem is that I think business and marketing broadly today uses white papers as meaningful substitute for community and conversation. There's this presumption that a data point is more robust than a conversation, is more robust than a relationship. And I don't think that it is, especially when we really scrutinize how a lot of data was gathered or measured or reported. When you're talking about diversity and populations and our trends and our culture, you're going to arrive at some false negatives, right? Or some false positives. My point being there that I think I really believe in this notion that 10 years ago, I think business pivoted to an audience first mindset and five years ago, business pivoted to a creator first mindset. And I think this moment, what we're really talking a lot about is I think pivoting to a community first mindset, right? And must be this idea that you cannot meaningfully understand anyone or serve anyone if you don't know them. And not just like as an audience, but as building with rather than building for or building to. And I think what a lot of folks get wrong is this presumption that somehow they know better and can make assumption about community based on data that they've gathered that is maybe questionable data. And then they can market that and gaslight people into liking it when it like wasn't built by or for the people that it's trying to serve. Yeah. This transcends beyond marketing, that transcends beyond business. That's just like a fundamental problem with society, whether it's lawmaking or product construction or whatever it might be. There's a lot of assumption that I think gets us into a lot of trouble. And I think that the assumption can be rectified or alleviated when your teams, your cap table actually look at the communities you're trying to serve and when you actually have meaningful community built with the folks you're trying to talk to. And I think that's what we're trying to help correct for. But the decks that I see that other agencies create or that companies create themselves about Gen Z, like I have seen pie chart graphs measuring the lit woke savageness oh, of celebrities. And I'm like, would I ever construct anything in that sort of pie graph? No. But what I also <laughs> vehemently disagree with, who they selected and to what extent they were lit? Yes. <laughs> but my point being that the stuff that we see is like really, truly shocking. And again, like that's one of the reasons why I started this company is that I became aware that there were 50-year-olds, maybe from really conservative backgrounds, who were consulting on Gen Z and using pie graphs like that to make some like bizarre caricature of us. And me being like, what the heck? Right? Like, if we're going to talk about Black and queer culture, we need Black and queer folks to lead that conversation, right? And yeah. if we're going to talk about Gen Z, we're going to need Gen Zers to lead that conversation and the intersection of these communities to be involved in those conversations. And 
I'm still to this day mystified by how much people are putting out thought leadership or claiming authority into things that they are so far away from. But so that's one of the problems that we see. Some work that we've done that I am proud of, a client that we love working with is Jansport, a VF corporation that you mentioned, where we've been able to do a lot of really meaningful work around climate, around mental health, around COVID-19 response that wasn't measured on some artificial metric of a pie chart, was instead really a client who was interested in learning from their team of high schoolers, of college students on our team to understand what young people were going through and how they could actually show up for that in a way that was resonant. Whether that was through nonprofit gives or through content with maybe content creators who didn't get the brand deals they should be getting because of the communities they represent and how they're often overlooked, or, or whether that's through creating space to talk about these things with professionals, or whether that's creating challenges that get young people and get people to participate in mass actions that push us towards the world that we need to live in. We've been really proud to work with folks who come to the conversation, like I was saying earlier, from a place of compassion and curiosity and community, yeah. who aren't working with us to check a box, right? aren't working with us to validate something that they've already built, but are working with us to build with us from a place of like, you have something to teach us, let's learn and let's build together something better and let's meaningfully actually show up with action that empowers young people. And I think that's what we've seen be really resonant with our audiences yeah. and also something that is really fulfilling to us as a company to work on and the type of work that we're really proud to do. Absolutely. It's so clear that as a product of your work, oftentimes you have to dive into a lot of socially and politically charged issues, just given the way Gen Z is more plugged into this stuff today. Whether it's climate, gun control, abortion, a lot of things that you just mentioned, given the current climate around deep, political polarization. How have you thought about that? And what has it been like bridging the gap with, as you say, some of these older marketing leaders who are very established? And my assumption being the person that you're liaising with in these organizations. So I think one thing that is really core to who we are and core to who I am is that I don't believe that the personal and political are separable. That is a myth and a really dangerous one that business has told us for a long time that we are expected to check our baggage, to check our politics, to check our identity at the door, because it only serves the status quo, that it only serves the people who are already in power. I believe fundamentally that as an American Muslim, as a person of color, that my identity has been politicized since the day I was born. For someone to say that they don't talk politics is they don't talk to me or about me, because like I am my politics, whether I want to be or yeah. not. Never something that was a choice given to me. My personhood and my political self are one and the same. And I think there needs to be a differentiation though between political and partisan. And I think in the business world, we confuse the two often. Yeah. Political is pertaining to policy, pertaining to issues that impact all of us, right? Partisan is talking specifically about candidates or two parties within a very complicated, very fraught political system that we are operating within. But I will say openly and loudly what side of this equation I am on, and that is not a secret. <laughs> but we are a political company. Because I think young people in Gen Z are a political bunch, we yeah. understand the gravity of the issues that we are facing. And so it would be irresponsible for us to lean away from them. When the world is quite literally on fire, we should be talking about it. We should be doing yeah. something about it. And the world is on fire both metaphorically and literally in a number of ways. And so we are a political company. We take political stance as a company. We post political content and we encourage our clients to do the same. And we will not shy away from that ever. And I tell my team, right, I would rather lose all of our clients by speaking truth to power than ever gain a client by being something that we're not. If someone sees our social media or sees our post or doesn't have a problem with politics, okay, they're not the client for me. Because we are a reflection of our generation. We are a company where we don't all agree politically on every single issue, right? Even if we all might share a general broad sense of what side sure. we are on, there's a lot of disagreement, let me tell you. Yeah. But we care. We care a lot. These are conversations, these are questions that we are interrogating around our lunch conversations at the office. And so we're not going to shy away from them with our clients because yeah. these are the conversations that matter to our cohorts, that matter to the present. And so I have never and will never entertain an idea of being an apolitical company because I don't think any such company exists in a meaningful sense anymore. I think that company can only exist so long as you exclude communities that have been politicized, which are the many. And so we talk about these things and we publish content about them and we're not going to stop. In my experience, there are a lot of organizations that want to move along that spectrum, right? They're the types that have never been politically vocal as companies, but recognize that that's something that they not only need to do, but should be doing. 
But I imagine it's tough for some of them because they've operated within this status quo for often decades. When you go into a client and you see that dissonance, how do you bring them into the conversation? So the question has to always start with what is your why? I know that sounds trite and a little cliche and maybe a little millennial, but what is your why? (laughs) And I say that to say that it's really important that an organization knows their why and not just a deck somewhere. Every person who works at a company should know what their company's why is in one sentence. And for us at Group Consulting, that sentence is we exist to empower Gen Z. That's who we are and that's what we do. And I hope everyone on my team knows that. I don't know if everyone does. It's a good reminder for myself to remind everybody. (laughs) But everyone should know that sentence because especially in a B2B to C company, how is your consumer going to know what it says about them to post that product, to be part of your community? If you internally don't know what it says about you to work there, to show up every day to work there 10 hours a day or whatever it might be. Because then once you know your why, it then gives you a roadmap of what you should be commenting on. Do you think yeah. what a lot of companies get into trouble with is they think like, oh, okay, now we're political, we comment on every single thing. And that's overwhelming. And yeah. this is to say that all things don't matter. Of course, like all things matter, but it isn't the place where every company speak on every issue. There are unfortunately a million and billion and infinite issues with society <laughs> at present. And I don't think it comes across well when a company only comments on something when it's trending, when it's like so big that you can't ignore it. Yeah. I think things feel authentic and true when they are authentic and true. I think in marketing, we talk a lot about authenticity and it's like, I don't think it's as hard as people say it is. If something is true, it's going to feel true. If something isn't true, it's going to yeah. feel forced because it is forced. Yeah. So you need to know what your why is and you need to have people who can architect that why who actually represent the communities that maybe are served by that why, fundamentally. And then what that looks like is, okay, say, a client will come to me and be like, okay, we stand for fun. That's our why. And I'll be like, okay, blase, but I'll take it. I'll buy it. We stand for fun. <laughs> What I think a lot of companies have done wrong is they've looked at that only in the affirmative and not the negative. So they're like, how do we make happy kids happier as their mission? Instead of, okay, if you stand for fun, the question that has to become, who has least access to fun? And how are we showing up with our messaging and with our programming to serve them? So what are we doing for kids who don't have access to recreation? What are we doing for kids in refugee camps who don't have access to any form of recreation? What are we doing for kids in underfunded schools who don't have quality access to recreation? Whatever it might be. Those are the questions we ought to be asking. And then what do we comment about? We comment about policies that impact young people's access to recreation, young people's access to mental health services, young people's access to being happy, to experiencing fun. Right? That is our why. You tether your statements, you tether how you're showing up into that mission. And I think... Where a lot of companies see disconnect is they don't have that mission clearly outlined. And if they do, it's maybe spread across 17 slide decks that were made by some archaic outside shop. And they, in some weird flow chart that no one can really digest and that isn't really an anchor. It's kind of just more noise. And they paid a lot of money for that slide deck. So like, no, we have to anchor ourselves in that. But it's not working. And so I think you see a lot of rocky waters consequently Because I think a lot of companies are missing that anchor and are probably anchoring in the wrong places. Absolutely. You talked about how a lot of these companies tend to wade into these issues when it's trending. And to me, the most obvious example of that in recent memory is obviously Black Lives Matter, particularly after the murder of George Floyd. I'm curious what you saw in the space at that moment from the Jew perspective and after the fact. What I will say is... It should not have taken a pandemic to make folks wake up to the fact that we are only as healthy as a society is the least healthy among us. It should not have taken a pandemic for our folks to wake up to the crisis that is our healthcare system in this country. It should not have taken a murder for folks to wake up to the brutal, ongoing systemic racism in this country and police brutality in this country. It should not have taken these horrific tragedies for folks to wake up to what has already and always been true. Right. I think what was really complicated about the moment was there have been folks within these companies, within these spaces, and certainly within organizing and activist communities who've been advocating for these policy changes, been advocating for these issues, advocating for the necessary shifts for decades, for centuries. And only now we're given a platform to talk about them. We're only now taken seriously. I want for these folks to be taken seriously. I'm really angry at a world that asks of more murder to be incurred for folks to be taken seriously, as if enough tragedy has not already been incurred for these conversations to be worthwhile in a meaningful sense right now, right here. And I'm also really disappointed that it seems like a lot of those conversations were fleeting. It seems like it was like, oh, let's do this right now and solve it, put a Band-Aid on it, but not actually be invested in reimagining 
what all of this could look like. And I think I have certainly seen a tremendous shift in the whatever, 10 years, seven years that I've been doing this work insofar as I used to have to convince people that Gen Z was important. I used to have to convince people that purpose was important. I used to have to convince people that these things that we were talking about were important. Uh, that's less the case now, but I think we're not all defining important the same way. And I have been disappointed and disillusioned often by how small many people's definition of the word important is, is what I'll say. And I'm also frustrated and challenged at how the business ecosystems that exist. I feel this way as a business leader. The paradigms that we've constructed, how business operates, does not incentivize these conversations, does not incentivize the emotional labor, the political labor, right? And so we are constantly internally talking about how do we stretch our imagination? How do we stretch our clients? And we don't always get it right. I'm not saying that we're the perfect example of purpose or mission at all. I don't think that that's the case. We have a lot of things to work on internally about how we respond to the inequities around us, right? How we show up and we're the farthest thing from perfect. But I would hope that we are fully convinced in this moment of the urgency and importance of these discourses and not just to talk about them, but to do something about them. Yep. And I hope that they're ongoing because this is not a one-time fix. This is lifelong learning, lifelong doing yeah. to unravel the really systemic problems that we're facing as a society. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think something that's made it so clear that still for so many, this is not considered a business imperative is that as the market turns, the first few budgets and people to go are those focused on ERGs or focused on cultural competency within the organization. Just demonstrates that it's not yet viewed as core to the business. Well, yeah. And I think that's what I'm saying. Like, I think it's really challenging. The business ecosystems that we have that exist are constructed in a way where you have to justify every dollar what the ROI is on it, right? Yeah. That is what a quarter-to-quarter publicly traded markets domino effect has had on us as a society. And I've not escaped that. Like I was saying, like I would go back and do all this again. I have internalized a lot of these really perverse complexes. I do measure my success too much on a quarter to quarter scale and probably think too much in ROI metric. And I don't like the way that, that makes me feel. And I don't like that that's the way that I am. And I can name it now as an adult, but it doesn't mean that I'm free <laughs> from it. Right. And yeah. I am challenged by what this job has done to me, has done to my soul. I love so many parts of it, but like I was saying, I don't love all parts of it. I don't necessarily (laughs) love running a business and I hope that it's possible to maintain integrity, but it is challenging, especially in these moments in terms of the economy, when you have to make certain calls, the business ecosystems that exist do make it challenging. I wish for a world where doing what is right doesn't feel so impossible so often and we're trying to shape that world. It seems with each passing day that we have a long and hard and arduous road ahead of us. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being candid about that. And to that end, I want to speak a little bit about your future. So outside of Juve, and as it's related, it seems like you do a lot of speaking. You've given TED Talks. You've also done a lot of work in the political sphere. I know you worked on Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. What do you envision in your future? I mean, do you see a life in the world of politics? No, I aspire to be a good father and to sleep more and to take better care of myself. And I am doing this and I love it enough that I keep doing it. And I love the people that I get to do it with. And I have a lot more to learn and a lot more, like a lot of things we talked about today, like unanswered questions, things that I'm still working through. I have a lot more to work through. But no, right now I'm focused on the challenges and problems that I'm trying to fix right now. And what I aspire to be is a better human than I am today. And it is doubtful that that the arena that you just mentioned would make me that. And (laughs) I don't know where the road will take me, but I hope it takes me to a healthier place than I am today. And I mean that. I think I spent a lot of time caring more about being right than being kind. I think I spent a lot of time thinking through the lens of ROI. I aspire for a moment in time when I can dance for the sake of dancing, read for the sake of reading, laugh for the sake of laughing, learn for the sake of learning. And That is the muscle that I most miss exercising at present. And so whatever I do next, I hope that it includes exercising those muscles without maybe a direction in mind. But it is doubtful that it takes me to a place maybe even more perverse than the one that I sit today. Well, I appreciate that you're so intentional about where you're trying to go. With respect to the future of Juve, Gen Alpha is now on the rise. You know, the eldest among them are now entering their teens and will soon be considered a core target market. 
Do you envision a world in which Juve expands its scope to include Gen Alpha? I mean, what does the future of Juve look like? Look, we increasingly think of ourselves as community builders, digital first, purpose driven marketers, and storytellers and translators between Gen Z and adults, between influencers and brands, between activists and business owners, between parents and their kids. We serve as a convener of people and we try to make creative and culture and community happen around these conversations that mean a lot to us. And increasingly less of our work is like Gen Z specific, it's us bringing our perspective to the table as diverse young people, but making things happen more broadly speaking. I get this question a lot about Gen Alpha. As you mentioned about intentionality, I hope nothing else. Like I, look, I, I am the first to admit I've made a million mistakes. I am not what I need to be as a human being or as a leader. But I hope to be intentional as a leader. That's something that's really important to me. I hope to be thoughtful as a leader. I think it was important to me. I don't ever want to be the reason I started this company. I started this company because I saw people 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years my senior talking for me. I don't ever want to be in the business of talking for anybody else. That's not what feels ethical, good, or right to me. And I think that's what I want to change about the business world. Would I be more than happy to work with, to partner with, to amplify, to empower our Gen Alpha who is interested in doing similar-ish things. Maybe not exactly how I did it, because like I said, I made a ton of mistakes and I wouldn't do it again. But yeah, I'd be down to do that. But I do not have a business plan about how to make money off of another community that is not my own. And I will never. Yeah, I think that's a very, very powerful thing for you to say aloud. The last question I have for you is, I mean, amidst all the success you've had, all this reflection you've clearly done, what's been your proudest moment thus far? That is a really hard question. I would say of all the things that I am, I am most proud to be my nani's grandson and my mother's son. And to whatever extent I have made my nani proud is my proudest achievement. Well, Zia, thank you so much for joining me on Trailblazers today. I mean, it's just so phenomenal to hear your energy. It's so resonant. It's just so clear that you're so passionate about what you do. Some days, some days more than others. Some days more than others. I, know, but I, I appreciate the candor too. I mean, it's not easy for people to admit that maybe they would have taken a different path or would have done it differently. Um, so I, I respect that a ton and appreciate you sharing your story. I appreciate, thank you for having me, my friend. It's an honor of to be course. here. I'm really grateful for the work that you do to provide more community and space and amplification for our community. And just grateful to be your friend and to make community with you. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. If you want to get new episodes straight to your inbox, subscribe to our newsletter at SouthAsianTrailBlazers.com and follow us at South Asian Trailblazers on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn.